Vikes now. I am Dustin Baker. This is the pre-Thanksgiving edition. The Vikings are six and five uh, in the driver's seat for the postseason. Oddly, their loss at the Broncos really didn't change anything because the Buccaneers lost against the 49ers and they are the one team with a positive tiebreaker against the Vikings and could give them fits if they got hot and the Vikings began to collapse. Alas, I am here with Josh Fry. We're going to talk about some of that Denver action, some of the Chicago action. How's your holiday week kicking off? It's good, man. Uh, a little busy, but that's okay. Uh, ready to head down to Milwaukee later today, spend some time with some family, and yeah, should be a good weekend. Excellent. All right, let's talk about uh, some of the the one-point loss. The Vikings lost 21-20. They cannot stop with these close games, whether they win close or lose close. It is just an epidemic for Vikings football since the start of 2020. Now, we had a honeymoon period, which I will argue is either paused or over with Josh Dobbs. The five-game winning streak without Justin Jefferson was snapped in Denver. But I want to know from you, kind sir, did the Vikings' loss at Denver lessen your opinion and outlook on Joshua Dobbs at all? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it lessened anything. If anything, it kind of just confirmed <laughs> some of the concerns that we had going in when they actually acquired him at the trade deadline. Like we talked about it that Wednesday, right after they made that move. Um, the big questions with him are going to be, can he stop with the turnovers? Can he face the pressure and deliver accurate passes? And I think for the most part, he's done a pretty decent job of delivering those accurate throws. I mean, especially down the stretch of that game against the Broncos. I feel like TJ Hawkinson probably could have gotten down with a couple of those passes on that final drive. Um, and he, overall, I feel like he did a pretty decent job throwing the ball. But again, it's just those turnover things. And it's it's a goofy thing that's plagued the Vikings all year. And uh, Dobbs, he, he had that fumble at the beginning, which, I mean, isn't necessarily his fault, considering <laughs> it probably should have been a penalty on that play. And it led to a four-game suspension for Kareem Jackson. Um but yeah, just some of those things that we already were a little bit concerned about when they made that trade feels like they're just coming into fruition. So I still feel like this is a really good football team. I wasn't necessarily concerned at the end of that game, considering they were definitely in a position to win that game throughout most of the game. Um, and just a few silly mistakes cost them at the end. Um, but yeah, I wasn't I, I don't really think. I think this is a really good football team, but I don't think it's a good football team necessarily because Josh Dobbs is going to be the top 15 or top 10, whatever quarterback spot <laughs> you want to put Kirk Cousins in. Um, I think it's more he has really good weapons around him and the defense is playing their asses off throughout this past six weeks or so. So I think those are the main reasons why I have confidence in this team. But I think Josh Dobbs is plenty capable of at least being a game manager. So there was always going to be a reason whether we found it out against the Falcons, we found it out against the Broncos, hopefully not Monday night. There was always going to be a reason that the Browns, the uh, Lions, the Titans, and the Cardinals said no thanks to this guy, even as a QB3 or practice squad in some of those situations. So here's my take, and I want to know if there's anything wrong about it. I, I don't, th I think what we saw against the Broncos, this is what... This is what Josh Dobbs is. Now, for instance, if Justin Jefferson is playing, they might be able to rattle off a game-winning field goal and win that thing 23-21, and then nobody really cares about the turnovers. I think that's the margin. That's the difference. But in terms of hanging in the pocket, some sometimes it's celebrated because he's fearless. Sometimes it's panned because it's like, what are you doing? Throw the, get rid of it. Um, and then the curious passes at times or just the fumbles. I think this is this is what you get. This is why this dude was a fourth rounder, as you probably scouted him six years ago. And this is why he's been a journeyman to date is because some coaches like Mike Zimmer that couldn't stand turnovers and, you know, would refuse to play a player if that was part of his toolkit. So I believe that you're going to have a lot of the flashy stuff. It was a really sweet touchdown pass to Josh Oliver. He had another rushing touchdown. They did, other than that, he didn't really use his legs too much, which I think he needs to start doing again. But I'm fairly convinced that whether it's the fumbles, the goofy interceptions, hanging in the pocket, but then the dazzling dancing out of fourth and seven runs Atlanta, I think it's all part of the experience, the roller coaster. Is that accurate? I think so. And I mean, especially with Kevin O'Connell, I think he's going to embrace a little bit of an aggressive mindset with Josh Dobbs. I mean, it's similar to what we saw with Kirk Cousins last year. I mean, he was up near his career high in interceptions, but he was delivering those deep balls when the Vikings needed them. And sometimes it results in a turnover. Sometimes it results in a really good play. And I think that's just kind of it's a different version of that with Josh Dobbs. But I think it's 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 along the same sort of guidelines that we saw with Kevin O'Connell last year and continue to see with Kirk at the beginning of this season. So yeah, I'm pretty much on board with that. 
And when Dobbs has those follies, whether that happens against the Bears, the Raiders, the Bengals after that, I remain also firmly convinced that Flores' defense has to at least force a turnover, one or two of its own. Otherwise, this is how the season's the rest of the season's going to go. And this is how it started, too. Even with Cousins in there the first three weeks, it, uh, it was an opening drive fumble or pick and we're like oh god and that's exactly what happened against the broncos yeah i mean and they came really damn close to forcing that turnover too i mean ivan pace was inches away from coming up with that fumble recovery oh on that yeah touchdown i forgot drive. about that until right now yeah i mean if he no, if he had actually if he had noticed the ball as it was mm-hmm. going out of bounds he probably would have been able to come up with that but just his positioning when he made that tackle it just harmlessly bounced out of bounds and broncos were able to win that game and if Things turned out a little bit differently. The Vikings still probably win that one. <laughs> well, maybe they'll go get Shaq Leonard uh, to exactly, help, help yeah. force some of those fumbles. Uh, I think 32 fan bases are chatting about that until he signs somewhere. All right, let's pivot a little bit to Chicago. I have unearthed this stat ad nauseum. Feels like for two years in a row. Will the Vikings finally spank an opponent and beat the shit out of the Chicago Bears? Or are we looking at another squeaker or will it be in between? Because at some point, it's been four years, the Vikings just need to crush somebody. And if it's not the Bears, I don't know who it's going to be this year. Yeah, I, I'm i going back and forth with this one, too. I mean, the, the, the really big concern that I have going into this game is just how dominant this Bears defense has been, especially against the run. Mm-hmm. And it, it's been a really sneaky, underrated part of the season. As, uh, and I mean, the Bears are three and eight, so nobody really cares. But I mean, they lead the league in terms of yards per carry allowed this season. I think they're 3.4 yards right now. So that doesn't really bode well for a Vikings rushing offense that hasn't really been able to do much <laughs> this season. I mean, they they definitely got on track last, well, last weekend against the Broncos, season high in rushing yards. Ty Chandler looks great. And that gives me a little bit extra hope, but I I do think we're looking more towards the middle of that, where it's somewhere that that we're probably looking at fourth quarter. It's a one possession game and maybe the Vikings make a few plays and pull away, or maybe the bears make a couple plays and we're looking at a game where we're sweating another one out. I (laughs) I really don't know where to go with this one right now. (laughs) Yeah. I'm leaning toward right in the middle. I would love, well, everybody would love finally for them to just beat somebody kind of like they did the saints until they didn't when it was 27, three visions of grander suggested, Oh, they're going to win this thing 34 to three. And we're going to be in the sat- driver's seat. Of course they, they didn't do that. Uh, so with the bear, with the bears and Vikings, that's two top 10 rush defense per EPA per play. So I think it's going to come down to, you know, who can get uh, enough runs through the cracks or the crevices of the game or just Dobbs v. Fields through the air. And that one, it depends on which version of Fields show up. That one could be uh, a crapshoot. I, I ultimately, I'm going to pick the Vikings 34 to 20. Do you want to give a prediction? What, five days out? I'm going to go, I think, 28-24 Vikings for okay. this one. So you are um, keeping it within the, the one-score window. Yeah, I'm keeping it within the one-score window. I mean, <laughs> Kevin O'Connell, you, can, you can't bet against that at this point. It happens mm-hmm. every single week without fail. So I'm, go, I'm going with it again. All right, so <clears throat> to start the season, whether it was 0-3 or 1-4, the Vikings at the time felt like they needed a mathematical miracle to reach the postseason. Well, guess what? They, they found that because they won five games in a row, all against NFC teams with about three of them who are going to be in the chase for the sixth or the seventh team in the wild card. Now they would need a, a pretty gross collapse to miss the postseason. It's really weird how this roller coaster has taken us. Where will the Vikings finish in the NFC's playoff picture? Assuming you think they will in general. Yeah, I mean, we def- we talked a little bit about this off air yesterday. Um, and I'm assuming that's why we're talking about it now. Um, but I, the more I think about it, I really feel like the Vikings have a chance at that number five seed in the Ooh. NFC, and then they'd go face whoever wins that mess of an NFC South in the wild card <laughs> round. Um, I mean, you look at some of the schedules. I mean, Seattle, they haven't looked great over the past three weeks. A three-point game against Washington, blowout loss against the Ravens, and then another loss last weekend against the Rams. And who knows what happens with Geno Smith? He's hurt. And now you look at their schedule coming up. They play San Francisco twice, and that's sandwiched between a road game against Dallas, and then they play <laughs> Philadelphia. Like, I, I don't give them much of a chance in any of those games, especially if Geno's going to be limited or even out for any mm-hmm. of those games. And then you look at Dallas, too. I mean, they they don't have an easy schedule either. I mean, they play Washington this weekend. But then, like I said, they have to play the Seahawks. And 
whoever win, whoever loses that one, that's only good news for the Vikings in terms of moving up in the standings. Um, and then they play Philadelphia again, who they played tough, but they lost. And I continue to believe that this is one of those teams going back to last year, even they blow out all the bad teams, mm-hmm. but they find a way to lose against every single good team. I mean, you look at all the wins that they've got this year on the road against the Giants, against the Jets, against the Patriots against the Chargers, against the Rams, and against the Giants again. And then against the Carolina Panthers last weekend. They haven't beaten a team that's over 500 yet this year. And now they've got four games against 500 teams or better coming up against Seattle, Philadelphia, on the road against Buffalo, at Miami. I I think that's a really tough schedule coming up. And the Vikings only play two teams with winning records. And one of those teams is the Bengals, who just lost Joe Burrow for the year. So I feel like the Vikings have a really good shot at moving up to that number five seed if they can just – take care of business and win these games that they should. Yeah. And that is, I love, I love this take. Well, a, because it puts the Vikings in the five seed and B it hasn't really been uncovered yet. Uh, I, th- I think what the Cowboys have going for them is that so- sometimes when they play those bad teams, they'll win like 50 to 10 and, right. it, and it gets everybody really excited. Um, but then they'll turn around and lose to a good team. It's kind of like the dolphins and it's just the dolphins are taking heat for it. And the Cowboys, they're America's team. They're all, Even though most people realize or agree the Cowboys will lose before the NFC Championship, there's still hope that, oh, they can turn into something more because they're America's team. But two brutal schedules, and the Vikings had this too to start the season. And now, especially with Joe Burrow out, which changed everything about the trajectory of that game, I I think most of us looked at that that game in May and then even two weeks ago, and they're like, well, you're going to go in Cincinnati and it's going to be just like Denver. You're going to lose. And not that it was completely unwinnable, but that it was probably going to be an L now it flips to probably a W so assuming the Vikings are good in general and they believe that this Denver thing hiccup was a one game deal then you have the Bears the Raiders the Browning Bengals and then you have the division games and even if the Vikings were two and 12 or two and 10 or something right now, they should have a puncher's chance against the lions and Packers because that's how those teams do business. So if they get the five seed, then you flip around and say, all right, well then they're going to play the saints or the Falcons. And I don't know, would you, would you, we wouldn't certainly think we got this in the bag, but would you have any apprehension about going on the road to new Orleans or play in Atlanta again? I mean, at this point, from what we've seen from those teams, definitely not. I mean, mm-hmm. the Vikings showed that they can definitely blow out the Saints. They just made a few dumb mistakes again <laughs> in the second half of that game to let them get back into it. And Jameis Winston made a few just ridiculous throws that 99 times out of 100 probably aren't going to happen again. Uh, so I feel like especially with the Saints, they're probably not going to win that one. And then Atlanta, Desmond Ritter at quarterback, that doesn't scare me that much. I mean, Bijan Robinson is a really good running back, but I, I just with this rushing defense right now, I don't think that they I don't think that I'd be too worried about going against against these Falcons. Yep, it, I, I can I can feel it in my bones, how it would feel going into wildcard weekend where it's like, sweet, we got the saints again or the Falcon. We'd be a little nervous because they're like, all right, we already beat them. It's tough to beat a team twice in a year. They're on the road. Is this going to be one of those Dobbs turnover game? But I mean, that's going to happen. If, if cousins was the quarterback, we'd be feeling that way. All right. I'm going to throw you one wild card. I want you to predict who's going to win the NFL MVP. Oh man, this is a tough one right now. Um, <laughs> it's so I, wide open. It is crazy, especially you consider all those teams in the AFC within like half a game of the one seed right now. I think there's five of them right now. Um, but I, I think this might be a little bit of a weird one, but I'm I might go Miles Garrett. Wow! If the, if the Browns are able to keep up their winning ways and they don't have Deshaun Watson anymore, I don't really think you can give that award to anybody on their offense right now. And Miles Garrett is the leader of that defense. They're right up there for that number one seed right now. And if they get that, I, I, I think, I don't really know how you don't give it to Miles Garrett. Yeah. We haven't talked about enough in terms of NFL speak. Vikings fans don't care how, how damn good the Browns defense is. It's not just the best defense in the league. It's teetering on one of the best defenses in the last 15 years. And so for their sake, their fans sake, it's criminal that all they really need is like 75% of Deshaun Watson to probably do something special, but they have to re- rely on our guy, Dorian Thompson Robinson, who we, some of us love coming in, uh, out of the draft. Uh, so yeah, I like all that. would be so cool if a defensive player finally got it. I think what I'm leaning toward is Jalen Hurts, not because 
I mean, every time I watch him, I'm like, this guy's pretty good. But I never once feel like that Mahomes anxiety that you have when you're like, oh, God, oh, here we go. It's just I watch him I'm like this guy's pretty good. I think because they're going to end up with a 14 and three record or so, he's going to have, what, 15 rushing touchdowns and then 25 passing touchdowns. I think because there's no other horse that's guaranteed to get it like Mahomes or Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson, I think it might be the year where the voters, if they don't do the Garrett thing, are like, well, yeah, man, the Eagles are 14 and three and Dobbs is, or uh, Hertz has got 40 touchdowns that that might I think that might do it almost like uh, like maybe one of the tightest MVP races in terms of parity, like, you know, 15 votes for Hertz, 14 for Mahomes, 13 for Lamar, something like that, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if the Eagles continue their winning right now, I mean, they have the best record in the league for a reason. They've been able to make big plays. And a lot of that has been Jalen Hurts either doing it with his arm or doing it with his legs. And he's been a really great centerpiece for them on their offense and they're cruising right now. So, yeah, I I wouldn't be upset about giving it to him either. I'd. I'm just I I I want it to go to somebody that's not a quarterback once. In my, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it, well, last time we had it, we celebrated. Maybe not you because you weren't yeah. quite here yet. It was Adrian <laughs> Peterson in 2012? All right, Josh, you have a wonderful Thanksgiving tomorrow, and we will talk to you next Wednesday for the bye week. We'll see what kind of talker we have then. All right, sounds good, man. Have a great Thanksgiving. All right, you too. Later.